Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the Future Trends Forum. I'm your host and cat herder for the hour, Brian Alexander, and just thought you should know we passed a little milestone just now. This is the 40th Future Trends Forum session. My hat's off to everyone, every guest, every participant, everyone at Shindig and Nizernet for supporting us. 40. Well, welcome. This is the Future Trends Forum. Um, we have a lot to cover today, so I'll get things started. So first of all, um, we have, uh, Olivia, if you could advance the slide, please. Uh, first, if you haven't been here before, or if you have and you need a reminder, the forum is a spinoff of my Future Trends in Technology and Education project. The FTTE report is a monthly analysis of current trends in education and technology, trying to use them to get a handle on the future of technology and education. If you haven't seen the report, go to FTTE.us you can download some sample ones or sign up for the whole thing. Now, I have to say before we go further that we can only do this work with the forum with the help of generous friends. So first of all, uh, we have the sponsorship of NizerNet from New York State, a great networking group that works with the New York State colleges and universities, and we thank them very much for their help. And as you can tell, we are also thankful to Shindig because Shindig provides help in two ways. They provide the technology that we're using, and I'll tell you about how to use it in just a second. But also behind the scenes, they provide wonderful people. Like today, Olivia Nahoyan, who is helping us make sure that all the bells are ringing and all the whistles are chirping. So thank you very much to Shindig. Now, speaking of Shindig, let me just introduce you to the platform of where things are, if you haven't used this before or if you need a reminder. So first of all, up on the top of this, is the stage. This is where I am. Hello. And this is also where next to me is a PowerPoint presentation. Don't worry, that's going away in just a couple of seconds. This is where our guests will be. And this is where you can be. I'll explain that. Below is where all of you folks are. I think of this the participant swarm. This is where every person who shows up is visible, either as a gray silhouette or as a picture or as a video feed. So you will watch as we go on that people will begin to move back and forth, kind of like people at a party or at a concert. Uh, this is where most of the people will be. Now, if you'd like to interact with us, if you want to sit back and listen and watch, that's just fine. But if you'd like to ask questions, if you'd like to participate, there are a bunch of ways. So first of all, if you'd like to come up on stage and ask me or better yet, my guest, a question, just click on the very, very bottom right hand corner of the screen, one of two dots. There's an orange dot with a hand and the word raise. If you click that, you'll tell us that you want to come up on stage. So if your mic is working, your video camera is working, click that. It will bring you up as soon as possible so you can ask us questions. Love doing that. If you haven't seen it before, it's really easy to do. Now, if you don't feel like being up on stage because maybe you're shy or you have a place or your technology isn't working, that's fine. Click the other orange dot, the one that says ask. Then you can type in a comment or a question. And when the time is right, we'll flash it up on the screen so everyone can read it, and I'll read it out loud so everybody else can hear it. Now, if that's not enough, if you're on Twitter, you can tweet using the hashtag FTTE, and we will be watching that very, very carefully. Uh, and people will often give us comments or questions, sometimes people who can't be in here because of technology limitations. So if you'd like to tweet out, please go ahead and do that. And last but not least, if you'd like to talk to other people in this group, there are a lot of ways of doing it. One is to use chat. So if you just mouse over your cursor, you'll see a few different boxes. One of them will say, I am chat. If you click that, that gives you a little option to type in text so you can type in text to people in your chat room, which is about 16 to 18 people uh, who come in with you. And also, if you'd like to talk to them, just click on them. And if they're up for it, you will get a little bubble where the two of you can put your heads together and talk and see each other, and nobody else can hear or see your conversation. So this is a very social environment. This is a very interactive environment. And we have a few different ways of making you interact, as you'll see. But first, Olivia, over to the next slide, please. Every week on the Future Trends Forum, we have at least one guest uh, who we find to be a brilliant innovator and interesting person in the field of education technology in the future. And this week, we're very, very glad to reach out to Texas for Kyle Dixon. Kyle's currently the director of the AT&T Learning Studio at Abilene Christian University. If you don't know Kyle, you have to dig into his work because for the past 15, 20 years, he's been doing a lot of pioneering and groundbreaking stuff in digital storytelling, in mobile learning, and also in new learning spaces. 
Now, today we're going to be talking about digital literacy, but we'll probably bounce off of a few other subjects as well. If you'd like to learn more, go to that link there, blogs.acu.e slash studio, and you can see more. Now, even better than looking at that, let's bring him up on stage. Lydia, if you can bring Kyle up, it would be great. Hello, Kyle. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, Kyle, if you could start us off by telling us what exactly you do as director of the Learning Studio. So um, five years ago, we ended up with a, a gift from AT&T that was sparked by some work that we were doing at ACU in mobile learning and mobile media. Mm -hmm. um, and so that enabled us to look around the country and get to see what are some of the best spaces out there that are bringing students together within a library context uh, to spark creativity, collaboration, and new modes of communication um, through new media. And so we're delighted we've been around five years. We can talk a little bit about the breadth of, of uh, some of the projects we've worked on. Um, but it was it was wholesale plagiarism, at, you know, in, in the early days, just uh, gleaning some of the best of uh, programs and learning spaces that that were beginning to percolate up all over the country. And so um, it was kind of a remixed space, I guess, is an, another way of framing it. That's a great way of putting it. And what a wonderful thing, since in higher education, we have a hard time learning from each other across institutional boundaries. It's great to see an uh, institution set up just to do that. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about digital literacy uh, and what you do with that, but I think you wanted to say a few words first. Well, I, I mentioned uh, checking in on Amy Collier uh, and your conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I, I kind of liked the way that Amy just opened with a, a type of pro provocation. Um, and so it, it struck me this week uh, that, that maybe one way into our conversation was um, a class I had a couple days ago. Um, I'd asked some students, these were incoming freshmen, and um, I'd asked them to define um, what a meme was for me. And uh, the majority of the students present, um, their consensus was it's uh, a picture of a kitten with some funny caption. Right? This is the sum total of their understanding of, of a meme. Uh, and so we introduced really probably the broader um, notion of a thought virus, a kind of a sticky idea uh, whose almost immediate ubiquitous kind of presence uh, through the web or through other um, media makes it really uh, a compelling and maybe sometimes pernicious idea in uh, kind of contemporary thinking. It strikes me that a lot of the memes that kind of move out there um, are immediately, sometimes uncritically, just kind of universally accepted. And so I thought I'd start by kind of pointing to the way education has sometimes picked up um, these kind of compelling, ready-made notions. Um, and the one that I've, we've been noodling on probably uh, the last number of years is this notion of um, not a sage on a stage, but the guide on the side. Um, these mm -hmm. kinds of ready-made kind of packages, um, I, I guess, connect with the way that we've talked about 20th century students, um, that, that our students are no longer consumers, they're creators, right? They're, that what we're developing in them, hopefully over their four years, is a sense of agency, uh, uh, allowing them to develop their voice. Um, and, and the threshold to the kind of digital creativity that we can work with students on is, has never been lower. Um, right. I, I was in a classroom the other day with 300 students, and I was remarking um, that we had more HD cameras by accident in the classroom um, than existed five years ago in our region of Texas. <laughs> right? And so the, the way that, that students by access, by by kind of a, a default of their access to the new tools and um, networks of creativity, see themselves as producers is self-evident. Right. But you posted, um, I guess, the last FTETE um, update, 
had a had a direct link back to the Sandvine 2015 uh, global internet phenomena report, and I we've been fascinated by that for the last couple of years. Um, but obviously, this year was the first year they were pointing to the 70% uptick in online streaming of media. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, especially in, in education, we've got to grapple with that sense of it's not an either or consumer creator, right? That, that if we look at the heartbeat of the web the last number of years, we end up seeing a space where our students are certainly consuming daily. Um, kind of huge swaths of uh, web content and media, um, and then have the ability to contribute something, um, maybe even something meaningful, um, uh, a message that they care about, some area of research or advocacy, uh, back into the broader kind of community of the web. So that's where I feel like uh, the Learning Studio and many new media centers and um, media labs kind of across the country get to sit at that intersection, um, sometimes squarely within the curriculum and the ways that we work with students and faculty, um, but just as often working with uh, students on co-curricular messages um, at film festivals that we're a part of here at ACU, uh, where students are able to communicate in ways that develop uh, not only the strengths of their writing, which they've got to develop while they're here with us. Not only the strengths of speaking in public for uh, while they're here on campus, um, but the way that we've we've kind of pointed to this third literacy, a new way of thinking about media literacy and, and the ways that they can use those tools to contribute messages um, with the broader web. So is this third so literacy this digital literacy? Well, I mean, I think that's a good question. Um, as, as obviously, um, Many, many folks have been trying to kind of grapple with um, the combination of terms that sometimes sit at this intersection. Um, information literacy, digital literacy, media literacy. Um, what, what strikes me is that digital literacy seems like it has generic sense of the umbrella term that seems to take in some of these other literacies kind of under its, its um, kind of spread. And then it sometimes ends up being used in uh, in place of maybe the things that we create uh, as a part of our digital lives or with, with digital tools um, in a way that kind of overlaps maybe a little uh, some of the ways media literacy or media fluency has sometimes been, been talked about. Um, and so maybe it's that sense that the terms have not really been clearly disaggregated always or are not being clearly applied by mm -hmm. all the audiences kind of leveraging the tools that makes it sometimes a, um, a linguistic suit. And so um, I, I would say some media literacy, where digital literacy is an extension of the ways that I contribute um, imagery and um, audio content, video content, um, communicating through the web and new web forms that space of media literacy fluency is probably the way that I come into digital literacy. Let me pause you just for a sec, um, Please. because I want to remind everybody that if you have questions about this, uh, or if you have comments or examples or reactions, yeah. again, remember we have a variety of interactive tools at your disposal. So if you'd like to join us on stage, click the raise hand, they type in a question, type the, uh, hit the ask button, uh, and if you want to chat, please chat, or you go ahead on Twitter. Don't be shy. Uh, and if you are shy, we'll call on you. No, I'm teasing. We will call on you. Um, and uh, over on Twitter, um, people are uh, mostly just uh, observing what we're saying right now. Um, if digital literacy overlaps with media literacy, let me ask, what can the new field of digital literacy learn from the classic field of media literacy? Well, um, media literacy in, um, in many of the ways that I've maybe uh, understood or uh, run into the term feels like it, it has uh, a, maybe a, uh, a sense of skepticism um, 
or concern about the reception and the, the kind of understanding of media. And that way, that sense of media literacy, I would probably connect to the way we've thought about information literacy sometimes. Mm -hmm. What we're helping is develop uh, a skeptical media audience aware of um, the potential biases, worldviews, um, kind of points of view of different media content kind of coming our way. And then I would say there is maybe a more, I'm not using this in a pejorative sense in terms of negative and kind of skeptical and positive and maybe more um, developing a sense of agency, but there is a maybe a forward leaning way of thinking about media literacy that is often um, wanting students to be able to tap into um, how they leverage the new tools of new media to communicate their own message or contribute their own voice. And so I, I would say the one maybe is a way of thinking about how we read media. The other is, is maybe thinking about or leaning into how we write media. Mm -hmm. um, feel free to, to, to respond to that, Brian. Does that jive with uh, ways that, um, that you've thought about the application of media literacy in the past? It does. I'm, I'm very fond of the skepticism, uh, or what some people call the bullshit or crap detector. Um, I think that's, that's one of the key aspects of media literacy. And I, I, I'm not sure that information literacy necessarily has that in practice, because it can sometimes be focused on already gated information, whereas I find digital and media literacy are about the wild world. Um, I think digital literacy really does emphasize production. Uh, and I, students as makers, and I think that's a, a huge, huge change. I'm, I'm pretty fond of Alvin Toffler's idea of the prosumer, uh, the people who combine consuming and producing. And you start off very well with memes, because memes are that really nice example where we, we can passively see them, oh, there's a kitty and a cheeseburger, but then we can do something with them. We can like them, we can share them, we can edit them, we can remix them. Uh, and that's, I, I think, I think digital literacy really has that that space now for that called productive skepticism. Well, I think that's one thing that social media has given us that the um, the world of blogs and wikis have given us um, this kind of gradual incline of um, web participation where there are some types of the participations you've just described, whether it's liked. It's you know liking or rating or that are a fairly low bar to entry retweeting. Um, I'm showing a sense, but I'm not creating new content or sharing some uh, new piece of information. Um, mm -hmm. And what I would hope to see us do, say, with the majors that uh, we're working with within a program uh, as we move students into graduate or professional study, is moving them. Um, where they are developing, maybe they're participating in a in a broader swath of that incline, um, where they are increasingly including more sophisticated content back into the system, um, rather than staying maybe uh, situated at, at the 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 on you know sitting on the on ramp and not getting fully up into traffic. Well. You know, I, I want to ask about that a bit more. If uh, if we're teaching students to be in traffic, right? And we're teaching them to to move uh, in the wider world. So that means going away from the LMS. It means going away from the library catalog. Uh, it means interacting with the actual world, and that has all kinds of affordances, all kinds of costs. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that digital literacy is a bit frightening or a bit disturbing. Um, is that it's a um, a much riskier enterprise. It's a much more adult enterprise, I think, a more realistic one. Um, sure. Do you think, what do you think information literacy has to say to digital literacy? So we have these kind of three different literacies at play here. Right. Well, can I, if I could respond to maybe the notion of um, how the, the affordances of, of the different maybe platforms or teaching spaces that we work in um, so, to our to the rest of the friends in the hall, I think Brian had a, a browser problem a second ago, so my guess is he'll be right back. I'm going to continue talking to him like he exists, okay? <laughs> so, um, 
I'm confident he'll be right back with us. I, it does seem to me um, that, uh, this is hardly original to me, that many of the platforms, the LMS uh, platforms uh, that we've worked with in the past, um, sorry, Brian, just picking up on your question, as we think about how LMSs have kind of structured um, our online learning spaces, um, the majority of the ways that those are being used uh, often to send content to students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. From the very beginning, podcast uh, initiatives on many campuses from 2005, 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. um, we're often mm -hmm. leveraging new tools like RSS to, again, um, send content down the chain, sending uh, content from the professor to the students or to groups of students more nimbly. And so I do think that the, the power of moving into traffic or, you know, whatever metaphor we want to pick up um, is in engaging the, the full two-way system, um, providing them opportunities in a way that's age appropriate if we're talking K through 12, if we're talking about the move to undergraduate and graduate. Um, that give them the opportunity to craft messages with an audience greater than one. Um, and so how can we leverage uh, broader communities interested in um, our students' research, or their, their areas of advocacy, their areas of, of expertise, as a way to motivate um, uh, a richer conversation? Um, I mean, it, it just strikes me that Ten years ago, we were preparing students in undergraduate study to share a professional voice with their discipline upon graduation. Right. right? But that sense of um, they have a voice with a fuse somehow. They're, they're waiting to, to be able to contribute back into the system. This side of the Internet seems um, quaint. It does. It seems quaint. It seems like uh, it's from the... Uh the wrong side of the tracks in a way that it's the world that uh, isn't working um i mean it, a worst comes to worst if you think about students going say five years through undergraduate program um, we may be de-skilling them um, by not teaching them how to participate in the larger world sure. it may be a retrograde thing well here's this great new thing you should try it's called betamax you know and it's just not going to be quite the same um, i think that's really going to take off that betamax uh, yeah, yeah, or PA, PAL. Um, well, with all these different literacies on the table, let's think about let's think about institutional structures a bit. Um, how does your studio fit into the library? Are you physically located in the library building at ACU, or how does that work out? Uh, we we are. Um, we're. Um, I, I suppose five years ago, about the time that this. Um, this facility was being designed and we were kind of planning our services, how we would kind of serve the campus. Um, the library, library was shifting to um, um, the entire three floors of print materials were being in, moved into compact shelving and in, into the basement. Uh, and so it's, it's like so many university libraries lived through the information commons um, revolution of 2004, 2006, 2008. And so I think this is now kind of the follow on to um, how do we provide uh, maybe the tools that students increasingly need across our campus. Um, if media culture is now not only impacting our journalism mass comm, our graphic design, a, you know, a handful of majors that have deep skills in um, these, these types of tools, then how do we make sure that access um, doesn't stop maybe at the departmental boundary? Um, and so the library very helpfully has been a great partner in uh, allowing us, for example, to bring DSLR cameras, light kits, um, uh, boom microphones, other kinds of audio equipment, and drop it right into the library catalog. Um, able to apply, you know, overdue fines and things as a part of the kind of typical system that, that already existed, not having to rebuild. Um, and so for a student to feel that, that sense of agency that comes with, um, you're not going to believe what my library card gets me access to. <laughs> um, really kind of open 
you know, opens their eyes as they're coming through the learning studio and coming to. Well, we have some questions about this that have uh, come uh, via the ask button. Uh, and one of them comes from uh, Michael Slade, who wants to know, the new media literacy moves beyond dialogue for those who both read and write. What do we call that? Is that multi-log? Is that omni-log? Um, well, I mean, I think this is the, this is the kind of, um, soup that we were describing earlier. I think we need maybe not be afraid of, and that in the early, um, I guess, you know, the first decade of these kinds of, uh, discussions, continuing to coin terms to try to better understand the new surroundings, the new capabilities, um, rather than being, Kind of fixed to a frame, um, right? There, there are things that there are ways that literacy, uh, thinking about media literacy or digital literacy, contributes meaningfully to our work within a library, within a, a liberal arts um, system. Uh, but there, there are certainly other frames that we might be exploring. Um, it strikes me that when we opened in 2011. Um, Many on the campus were looking to media centers like, you know, ours on many campuses uh, and assuming the frame of a uh, help desk. Right. Um, and so they're, they were walking up, want to find the person that knew how to do it, rather than wanting to um, arrive and, and be taught. I mean, that those... Uh, many of those help desk models don't primarily see themselves as an extension of the teaching mission, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, and so we, we chose uh, maybe to lean into storytelling. We chose, um, uh, with a lot of help, Lambert and the folks there for, the, for digital storytelling, uh, we brought them to campus. But it changed the frame, I think, in really healthy ways with both our faculty and our students. What we're doing is tapping into software to be able to develop um, skills in working with sound, image, and text, and the blending of those those ele those elements in a way that creates a, a kind of meaning. That's a really nice uh, progress um, and a nice model. But well, Michael, that's a, a really good question. I like the way that uh, your neologism has really tapped into a lot of different possibilities here. Speaking of possibilities, we have one more question, too. This is from uh, Jim Holton, uh, and this is, again, at, at a bridge of the question of literacy in libraries. Jim asks, what do you see as the primary barriers for students in creating content, or is the barrier in the publishing of content? Um, Good question. I, I mean, I think we are in a space now in 2016, where the significant barriers are not primarily about getting something onto YouTube and walking in and having an awareness of maybe sharing whether that content is being shared into a Google Drive and then you know sent on to uh, a, an LMS, whether it's being shared in you know Box or you know whatever the the systems that are in place on your your particular campus, um, the friction seems to be less and less on the um, sharing, uh, the publishing, there are just so many options out there, um, and so many of those are tapping into the mobile um, conduit that I have in my pocket or purse or bag. Right. Um, so the concerns that, that maybe in 2008 we had with just, is it even possible to think about using video? Maybe I need to, to leverage audio because, you know, the package is so much smaller. Right, those those feel like very dated concerns um, or questions today because the the lack of friction. To me, I think the the first part of the question, um, helping students, helping faculty um, develop an awareness of um, what do strong literacy practices on you know around communicating through media look like. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think very much where we felt like there was this, there was a strength to the storytelling frame in a discussion uh, about what what story are are you crafting? What story do you have to share? Can you can you say a bit more about that? Do you 
do you think that one of the challenges is getting faculty to model being digital creators for students? So um, I, there are many different ways, um, obviously, to think about how to tap into um, faculty curiosity and, and creativity. Um, probably by um, by accident, we fell into a model um, of starting first with faculty uh, through workshops. Um, so we had had the experience of uh, what the CDS, um, it, you know, uh, Center for Digital Storytelling and uh, now Story Space, what they were doing in these three-day workshops. And I know those workshops existed for years before we started. Um, but that was a really um, powerful model for us in that in the first two years, we had 60 faculty kind of lining up to spend three days with us without any stipend or honorarium or, or motivation outside of, I have a story that I'd like to share with my kids, with my family. I, you know, I'd like to understand this new way of thinking about media storytelling. And so they were largely... Um, intrinsically motivated because we started with personal. Now, first-person narrative um, storytelling is, was not the end of the line for us. It was a beginning. Uh, and so I would say, in a similar way, we've leveraged digital photography workshops for faculty um, who also had a, an intrinsic motivation to want their images to look better. So along the way, um, we could, in both of those types of workshops, really helps help faculty develop a greater awareness of um, the form, the genre, how they might um, teach using media uh, objects because they had created one themselves. Uh, and so that, that end around, not starting with students, but starting um, with faculty members, then had whole classes of students coming our way in that kind of second round. I, that, I apologize if that seems so painfully obvious and, and something that, that um, you know, you've seen universally. No, I think it was a good question. And Jim, um, if, that's a, uh, if you want to follow up on that, please, uh, please do. Think about that. See where that goes. Um, because I think there's a lot to be said. But, but we have reached the time in the Future Trends Forum uh, where those of us up on the stage climb off the stage and mingle with you in the audience. So the goal here I would like to have is for us to discuss where you see digital literacy happening on your campus now. Thinking about how Kyle has unfolded this, I and mean, he's been touching on one support role for libraries. He's also touched on how information literacy feeds into digital literacy and how media literacy feeds into digital literacy. And thinking about what this means for our students as both producers and consumers, where are you seeing this on your campus? So in order to do this, um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to climb off the stage and we're going to hobnob with you guys for the next five minutes to talk about that. Now, if you don't feel like talking or if you can't, you know, maybe you're in a crowded environment or maybe your mic doesn't work, that's fine. Just mouse over your own cursor, your own avatar, and one of the options will be a little lock. If you click that, nobody can talk to you without your permission. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're happy to talk to whomever, please just leave it unlocked and we'll bump around you and say hello. So let's take five minutes, uh, mingle, and then we'll all reconnect in about five minutes.
Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it was a real treat to get to mingle with folks. Uh, and we'll bring uh, Kyle back up in just a sec. Uh, I'm really glad to see everybody talking and chatting with each other. Uh, it may be an artifact of my copy of Firefox, which is having issues, but on all the participants for a minute, they were all gray silhouettes. And then a minute later, they all turned into faces and gestures and smiles. And it was just really pleasant to see. Um, so while we're uh, bringing up uh, Kyle, um, let me just say we had uh, say. Oh, and here's Kyle. So Kyle, what did you find out in your mingle session? Um, you know, I, I, I had a chance to, to uh, hear from a couple folks. Um, Mark from Albany was just, uh, I think that one of the insights he was sharing was the uh, as a CIO, the challenge of uh, maybe tapping faculty interest, um, that that first wave of faculty that are maybe inclined to participate in a workshop, um, to, to get involved in a new initiative, um, there may be, you know, a sense of uh, those, maybe the regulars that would, that would show up for a wide variety of, of new initiatives or the kind of first meeting. Um, but how to get maybe more broadly into um, all departments or uh, to tap the interest of maybe faculty that don't begin with an inclination or curiosity toward um, oh. new types of, of digital learning. And I think that, that was an interesting challenge probably that we all um, had bumped our heads up against. Yeah, no, very much. Um, and you have to wonder about the different types of faculty. Um, uh, I was speaking with a, a terrific um, structural designer who was mentioning that their campus was looking into some programs that could end up building digital literacy. And, and I asked what, uh, what departments who would be leading that, and immediately she said business. And that was really interesting to think about. Just, you know, not, you know, you think about media literacy and you think about, say, as you said, mass comm or communication or public speaking and so on. Uh, you think about digital literacy, you might think about, you know, computer science or maybe media studies. But that, it's, it's, it seems like it's almost always different from campus to campus, you know, which population is most interested. So we had a, um, a group in the other day. There's a, a new faculty member on campus. Um, and at her previous institution, she had developed some uh, digital media assignments um, connected to something in the field of economics called rockonomics. Hmm. Um, so these were music video parodies, and I, I was just a little curious to see where in the world this would go. We would not worked with it previously. Um, but I know last week we got, a, we got to see uh, some of the first fruits of her work with those students, and there was a particular group that came in and spent a great deal of time up here. Um, I know there was a computer science um, major, there was a, a marketing and PR, uh, ad PR major, there was an English major, all thrown into this macro class. Um, and so their version of Bohemian Rhapsody is now, you know, has now been um, shared with the internet. And I don't really say that to say, you know, run, don't walk, you've got to see this, um, this video. So much as to say, um, the, the level of mastery of core concepts required to kind of translate them from one maybe sphere of knowledge into a very different um, sphere of knowledge, um, that, that the role of the, the, the translator is not that different from the role of the teacher. And so those students ended up having to tackle, um, are we fairly representing the core concepts along with the, the kind of video shenanigans of the final project. So they have to work across intellectual and technical to succeed. Oh, that's an, that's an interesting kind of uh, uh, liberal arts background approach to have. Uh, before I go further, uh, we have a question that came in just as we were entering the mingle phase. Uh, and this is from Roxanne Fairfield. And so let me bring this up. Roxanne wants to know, doesn't the flipped classroom address media literacy in faculty evaluations of student assignments? And related to that, are apps helping with media literacy? 
So um, maybe I, I wonder Ro if Roxanne has a microphone on, if we could end up hearing um, her detail the the kinds of flipped classroom models that she's involved with or that she's seen. I know maybe the the unfortunate um, um, you know basic idea of flipped classrooms that uh, at least reigned at the beginning of the kind of rollout was primarily, it, it seemed to me it was primarily focused on media as a delivery mechanism for what I used to do in class. So it's still kind of a one-way model in thinking about how can media enable the professor a broader access to their, their students. Well, and so I'm very curious and interested to hear more about um, Roxanne's idea of, of student assessments. Roxanne, if, if, if you're ready to come up, uh... Please, uh, Olivia, bring me down so she can take my spot. Hello. Hello, Roxanne. Hi. Um, well, at Fairfield U in Connecticut, we're, we're seeing a lot of our professors go to that flipped classroom model. And I know from the students I have, I work in the library in the educational technology, personal library. So I've attended many of their workshops. And we have an academic uh, center that puts on um, professional learning session of faculty and, and some of our professional staff too. So I, I'm able to observe really on the peripheral our, our faculty members that I've given students assignments, media assignments, but um, I'm, I'm really just sketching out um, in my mind um, or painting with a broad brush what I've seen. And I really don't know how they're evaluating um, our students in those areas. I guess on a rubric, I would imagine I've seen some basic rubrics. But I'm curious as well how you um, integrate the media literacy and digital literacy, and how do you break one out from another? How, how do you separate those? Separate those. Roxanne, thanks very much for sharing uh, the question and then maybe a little more context. Um, I mean, I do think uh, one of the significant challenges in ramping up. Um, new assignment models in um, a digital literacy or media literacy uh, program is trying to find effective uh, assessment models or work with the individual faculty members to develop rubrics that on the one hand don't um, end up prioritizing the Frame. I mean, the, um, the, the, the way that the software delivers the content with maybe an undue emphasis on polish, on cinematic perfection, or, you know, given the, the quick turnaround of so many uh, assignments in a 15-week a, a or 7-week or whatever uh, length of the semester, that's just not going to be attainable. Um, but we try to um, find ways to model um, through sample stories and kind of uh, bringing in uh, uh, stories that effectively um, achieve that blend that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, that digital story, no digital story is going to be better than its script. And so finding ways for them to see what really strong writing looks like. But then also showing them um, these media projects where the image and the sound, maybe not just the, the recorded narration, but also other elements um, of the soundtrack, um, how they contribute to the storytelling and not simply recapitulate the script. And so to me, it's, it's maybe at its most basic, helping them in the training phase understand what we're shooting for um, what does what do, what do strong storytelling choices look like? Um, and then once we've processed those but before they begin their work, uh, working with them through the script phase and the production phase to kind of raise questions that ask them um, to really leverage all three of those those areas carefully, um, kind of consciously. 
guess, thanks. And the second part was, are you using specific apps, mobile apps, to increase the media literacy or the information literacy, digital literacy, all of, all of the literacies? Okay. So, uh, this is the literacy cavalcade. I can't, um, we'll, we'll see if we get them all in, Roxanne, kind of keep, keep it on. Um, I mean, I think every media center or uh, learning studio like ours has had to decide what can we support and support well. Um, you know, there are just so many platforms out there. And so what we've tried to do consciously is find a strong mobile platform, uh, a strong entry-level software platform, laptop, desktop, and then a, a strong kind of advanced uh, platform. So. Um, our advanced platforms, in, you know, in, in different particular years, early on it was Final Cut, and more recently it's Premiere Pro. Um, but I, I would not ask every incoming freshman producing a digital essay in a composition class, their very first experience in this space, I wouldn't throw every one of them in the deep end um, right off the bat. And so we've, we've worked maybe more recently with uh, Adobe Spark Video or Camtasia, um, trying to offer a way to make calculated storytelling choices in an app, to be able to model those and then to ask them to, um, to, to demonstrate their awareness of what, what strong choices would be. Um, but, but something, you know, in, in some of the mobile apps, whether it's iMovie for iPad or um, um, something like Spark, those stories could be turned around even in a, in a single class period or in a, in a a, a short, it could easily be trained in 15 minutes. Are, are you considering accessibility for students um, in the universal design concept? Students who may not be able to produce a movie is having maybe a closed captioning script and are you addressing those issues? I, I will say the um, accessibility in all of the platforms we're working on is still the most difficult challenge to be able to figure out how we support how we support or scale to a campus. Uh, we're currently um, supporting digital essays in 30 plus sections of freshman comp a semester, and so to, to um, find a platform where we could allow we could easily train all students to produce, say, closed captioning for every one of the, the stories that they would produce in a single semester, um, I think is a, a really important longer term aim when we can have the software come in and be able to do that for students. Um, but so far, we're working with the program directors in those departments, we've not prioritized that um, yet. I, I mean, I think, I think it's a legitimate question and I'd be you know, happy for, for us to be second guessed on that, that question. Thank you. Kyle, your background is uh, in literature, right? It is. Um, if anyone wants to um, um, hang around after to talk about 18th century satire or the early novel, um, I know Brian and I um, have enjoyed those conversations on sunny afternoons in Austin, so um, we can easily extend the session. But, but yes, my background is, is in literature. Well, I'm asking not just to get Swifty in, uh, but uh, because I wanted to uh, uh, just mention that when you're talking about teaching digital essay writing, um, that you have this disciplinary background, which really kicks in uh, with literature and, and composition as part of that as well. well and I, I do think, um, I, we're not, I'm not going to win the entire room over with this, but I do think that it, it's fascinating to step back into different periods when you, you can see um, a moment like the 18th century, um, the novel in embryo, or um, the, um, the essay. Right, the journalistic essay, these forms that didn't exist, and then they began, you know, to develop. And so I, I, I do feel like, in a lot of ways, the digital essay, the digital story, whatever we'll be calling this ten years from now, um, is in a form of of genre formation. It's developing its conventions, its its way of speaking. Um, 
you know, maybe the, the uh, more compelling way to think about that is the early days of cinema. Um, mm -hmm. So there are ways that digital essay is built on previous ways of communicating, mm -hmm. but it may also continue to develop its own um, digital language as, as we watch it continue to uh, evolve. Well, it's interesting that we have computers that we can look at as a pretty mature uh, cultural phenomenon with all kinds of established grammar and practices and cliches and subgenres. And then on the other hand, we have virtual reality, which is just beginning to figure out what it's doing. You know, digital essay is somewhere in between. Listen, Kyle, we could talk about this for a great deal of time, but we are actually out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for sharing your thoughts based on your experience at Abilene, based on your work with digital literacy. And as I said at the beginning of the hour, you work with mobile, with uh, digital uh, storytelling and new learning spaces. Um, I want to thank uh, Michael and Roxanne and others for really great questions. Thanks to Michael Berman for an important security tip, which I'm going to follow up on in about a second. Um, but we hope to have you back another time. I uh, would love to follow up and hear what your thoughts are. Um, and if, if you do have a few minutes to stick around afterwards, please feel free. I'm sure people will be glad to ask you questions. questions. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. Now, this is the part of the hour where I tell you where things are going next. So let me just mention uh, what is in store for you for the next couple of weeks. So next week, on December 8th, we'll have Kristen Eshelman. She's at Davidson College, where she's the Director of Digital Innovation, an extraordinarily bright person. Uh, I do recommend following her Twitter feed, uh, taking a look at her personal site, and looking at what the DLRD is going to end up being at Davidson College. Uh, this should be a very exciting event, and I'm looking forward to it. Now, that's not all we'll be doing on the forum. We also have our ongoing reading project. Now, the, a bunch of us have shifted from science fiction to reading a classic book in education called We Make the Road by Walking. It's a book conversation between two of the 20th century's greatest educators, Paolo Freire and uh, Miles Horton. And so far, we've had an explosive conversation. Uh, we have people commenting on my blog. We have Twitter, just a huge storm under the hashtag uh, Horton and Freire. Uh, we have people blogging about it, uh, people making images. They've been doing mapping of our conversation. It's very exciting stuff for a book that is deeply moving very thoughtful, very inspirational and challenging. So take a look, go to my blog, dubrainalexander.org slash tag slash road, and you'll be able to dive in and catch up. The book's in print and available online, uh, so I'd love to hear what you guys think. Please join us. Now, along with that, uh, we have to say, if you have more reading in mind, please go to ftte.us to find out more about the Future Trends and Technology Education Report. Go to shindig.com to find out more about how Shindig works. And in the meantime, we'll talk to you next week. Have a good week, people. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.